five. Successive Conservative governments have not taken advantages of the freedoms that Brexit gives us. Four. I would still vote leave, Liam. I would vote leave to my dying day, really. Three. The government never did tell us how it was going to get to net zero, but the whole thing was nodded through Parliament anyway. The normal people of this country should not be subject to this arrant bollocks. They should not. One. We have left off. Welcome once again to Planet Normal, the Telegraph podcast with Alison Pearson. Hello. And me, Liam Halligan. She can't take any more, Captain, warned Scotty <laughs> as the Starship Enterprise was pushed to the limit. She's going to blow. I love a bit of Star Trek co-pilot. <laughs> William Shatner as Captain Kirk. Leonard Nimoy as Spock, he of the Vulcan death grip. And Nichelle Nichols as the fabulous Lieutenant Uhura. She and Captain Kirk staged the very first interracial kiss on American TV. True story. Mm. And of course, there was James Montgomery Doohan, the Canadian who put on a Highland accent better than mine to play Chief Engineer Scotty. <laughs> he who specialised in warning Captain Kirk, she can't take any more, that the Starship Enterprise was about to crash and burn. Well, here on Planet Normal Co-Pilot, I'm wondering why the International Monetary Fund keeps warning that a similar fate awaits the UK economy. <laughs> the media's been full of the IMF's dire warnings that our economy, which grew faster than most last year, will shrink during 2023. I don't buy it, co-pilot. I just don't buy it. I'm done with the doomsters. And just as Planet Normal said, inflation was coming long before the Bank of England noticed, I now reckon, contrary to a commentary full of gloom-monger Scotties, that we'll soon be seeing the green shoots of economic recovery. So what say you, co-pilot? This pessimism surely has gone on for too long. It's weeks until spring. But surely there's a spring in your step. <laughs> What's all this Star Trek stuff? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, dear. I've just staggered over the line with my TV critic hat on. I was asked by The Telegraph to produce the definitive piece on Happy Valley, which comes to its grand climax on Sunday night. So I have just trotted out 1,600 words and a very excellent series it is, too, if there's any listeners who haven't seen it yet, Sarah Lancashire. Absolutely brilliant as Sergeant Catherine Corwood. And my final line co-pilot was that the world felt a lot safer for having that fictional police sergeant in it. They're only actors, Alison. It's not real. <laughs> They're not real monsters. They're just people dressed up as monsters. It's thrilling kind of realism, really. We haven't watched that in Halligan Towers. We did watch SAS Rogue Heroes that Ben McIntyre yeah. adapted which was absolutely fantastic. We really enjoyed that. And we're watching Babylon Berlin, is it? At the yes. Moment? Really good. One of my favourites. But back on the highly overrated planet Earth, yeah, as you say, the ever-reliable IMF saying that the UK economy will shrink by 0.6% this year. Did you see that survey saying that one reason that the BBC was very biased was none of the journalists understood economics? Not only did I see that survey, I actually contributed <laughs> actually, to that survey. You actually wrote it. But, but all, all my evidence, they seem to put the word not in every <laughs> sentence that I uttered and published it in their report. <laughs> well, I thought if they were tuning into the co-pilot Halligan, that they would understand economics very well. Now, I am a bit confused about this IMF. So we'll start off with a very good Velma fact for you. The IMF has got UK GDP wrong every single year since 2016. And I seem to remember our old friend Christine Lagarde having to apologise. So dastardly were her warnings about our poor country's performance. So this is the same IMF, Liam, which frowned on Liz Truss's tax cuts last year. And now those same brain boxes seem to be telling us that the economy has nosedived because we raise tax. Which is it? The same IMF that predicted before Brexit that even voting to leave the European Union would cause a Scotty type, she can't take it anymore, <laughs> crash in the UK economy. But then again, so did our own distinguished HM Treasury in a thumping 420 page report. There will be an immediate and profound economic shock if we vote to leave the European Union, said the Treasury in a series of forecasts described by George Osborne, Chancellor at the time, Remainer in Chief, as fact. And of course, the economy sailed on during 2016 and into 2017. And actually, on this third anniversary of Brexit, it is worth saying that since 2016, the UK has grown pretty much the same 
as Germany. There's a lot of doom mongering around. We haven't even seen what Brexit's going to do to the UK economy yet. We've had a transition period after rowing for three years about Brexit with parliamentarians, in my view, disgracefully trying to reverse the biggest act of democracy in British history. And then you had a pandemic. And since then, we've had the biggest war on the European landmass since 1945. We just don't know. But the UK, it grew faster than pretty much all the other advanced industrialized economies in 2022. You don't see much of that in the coverage of this IMF report. And this year, the IMF is saying through a combination of high taxes, which the IMF pushed for last year, plus industrial action, plus the fact that our energy prices are so high because we haven't got so much storage as other European countries, that we will actually shrink. I don't buy it. I think the IMF's behind the curve. It's taking its cue from the Bank of England, which said a couple of months ago that the UK is going to suffer the longest recession on record in 2023. Well, it hasn't happened. We haven't gone into recession yet, though, of course, the economy has been stalling. And I think this week, when the Bank of England raises interest rates, I suspect by 50 basis points, the 10th successive interest rate rise. I think the Bank of England will also release new forecasts, which aren't nearly as gloomy as the last one. And I think everybody will forget about this IMF prediction. But we've seen old bunter, Andrew Bailey at the Bank of England. Old bunter. You are the Violet Elizabeth bot to his <laughs> Just William, aren't you? I'm not. I don't like your forecast. I'm going to scream and scream and scream until I'm sick. And I can, you know. He's not a hugely persuasive figure, is he, really? He's not even an economist. He's a historian. But what's he doing? I don't mind historians. You know, some of my friends are historians. But (laughs) I really think, you know, you should have a PhD in economics or at least an advanced degree in economics. Don't want to rule myself out. If you're going to be the governor of the Bank of England. (laughs) There's still time for that doctorate, Halligan. I gave up on my doctorate because I've got a better job in journalism. (laughs) But this guy, they're now saying, is going to row back on his grossly exaggerated forecast about the UK's looming recession. I mean, where do these people get off talking us down? I do sometimes wonder with this country whether it's a particularly British disease, the revelling of our media classes in any sign of weakness. It's a particularly English disease, as Orwell taught us, that our intelligentsia just don't like their own country. No, but just talking about the economy, David Frost, Lord Frost, I had lunch with him recently. I'll get you. Oh. I'll tell you about that. I was obviously NFI. <laughs> <laughs> we did mention you. <laughs> Praiseworthy terms. But David Frost, obviously intimately involved in the Brexit negotiations, talking about this tight fiscal monetary policy and the high energy prices being caused by our own largely mistaken policy choices, obviously the highest tax burden for 70 years and crazy pursuit of unreliable high cost energy, something we'll come on to later. But but as Lord Frost points out, Liam, we've been out of the single market for just over two years. And in that time, as the OECD figures suggest, we have grown faster than France, Germany, Italy, and Spain. So What's going on? I'm going to be perfectly honest now. You know, as a passionate Brexiteer, it is three years since we had a Brexit dinner in London. Absolutely wonderful occasion. Lots of very elated people, a small but doughty bunch of journos like us who had gone against the grain. But I feel now, I feel very disappointed. I would still vote leave, Liam. I would, you know, I would vote leave to my dying day, really. I never wanted to be part of what I saw as a sort of grossly undemocratic, bullying organisation. But there really isn't much reason to rejoice, is there? Because the Conservative Party doesn't seem to actually have believed in the Brexit that its voters told them they desperately wanted. Is that fair? I think the Conservative Party is a broad church and a lot of Conservatives didn't want to leave the European Union. They believe in a sort of statist, supranational body, which I agree with you is just fundamentally anti-democratic. It's not just undemocratic, it's anti-democratic under the so-called QMV rules, qualified majority voting. Power is being drained away from nation states and therefore from local electorates, from national voters steadily and over a long period of time. 
I want us to be a trading block, of lots of interaction and collaboration and cooperation, of course. But I don't think you have to subjugate your own lawmaking and your own electorate in order to trade effectively with other countries. That doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. But I think it's very hard to see what's happened since Brexit in isolation because so much else has happened with the huge rancor for three years and then the transition period and the EU being, in my view, hugely obstructionist when it comes to Northern Ireland. A lot of my Irish friends and relatives will have a go at me for saying this, but I'll repeat the whole backstop protocol thing. It's a cynical hoax. It's a contrived problem. You do not need any infrastructure on the border. You do not need to threaten still fractious relations between Catholics and Protestants and the people in the dark on both sides, who, of course, have a ghastly on both sides track record of terrorism. Those people are still knocking about. But it seems to me that the European Union is deliberately making trouble, as indeed Michel Barnier has admitted in a fly on the wall documentary. Yes, he did, didn't he? You can solve this problem with authorised economic operator schemes with derogations for smaller firms, with behind-the-border checks as and when you need them. The idea that you have to check a bunch of lorries coming in from British supermarkets carrying sausages priced up in pounds, right? They're not going to be sold in the Republic of Ireland. They're priced in pounds. And yet the EU's doing huge numbers of checks on those borders in order, it seems to me, to deliberately foment division and wind up the unionist community. I understand why they're wound up. It's not the community that my family comes from, as you know, but I have huge respect for politicians on the unionist side who are trying to keep things together in the face of this deliberate provocation. And that's casting a really bad light over the whole Brexit journey. And of course, since Brexit, since the pandemic, the global economy has been on its uppers. We have cut some trade deals. I do think they've been beneficial. We aren't now paying massive annual payments to Brussels. But I agree with you, successive Conservative governments have not taken advantages of the freedoms that Brexit gives us in terms of the free port policies. That's been very, very diluted, in my view, largely by the Treasury in terms of trying to move towards more business-friendly regulation and so on. Brexit allows us to do lots of things that I think are fundamentally better for our economy in terms of our international trade and our domestic regulation. But politicians just haven't got on and done them because I don't think they have the intellectual grit and determination. And it's no wonder the Ramona tendency is there. You know, I I get emails every day from various organizations, some of them government funded, who are deliberately trying to stoke division and who clearly want a reversal of that 2016 referendum before the changes. And they will be serious, given that we've been in the European Union and its predecessors since the early 70s, until those changes had had time to bed in. I think they should have time to bed in. And I think opposition politicians should get behind what the British people voted for. Well, the Prime Minister said, didn't he, to mark the occasion, naming free ports, financial services reforms, regulatory reforms, research and development of a new subsidy regime as, quote, huge strides in harnessing the freedoms unlocked by Brexit. Well, you can forget huge strides, mate. It's probably, you know, more tiny, tottery steps out of prison. And as I said, Liam, I do feel let down. I'm not alone. There's a Mori poll this week. Nationally, 45% of people think Brexit's going worse than expected. That's up from 28% in 2021. Of course, 66% of Remain voters think Brexit's been a flop, but so do 26% of Leave voters. Now, none of these polls, Liam, ask about whether people want another referendum on rejoining. And I really don't believe that most people would want to go through all that dreadful upheaval and acrimony again. But I do think the government is obstructing the Brexit that we thought we were getting. And one of the reasons I voted for it was reasons of national sovereignty. I wanted us to control our own borders. (laughs) We quite clearly are not controlling our own borders, I would suggest. I think something we should tell listeners that something we particularly both enjoyed this week was the magnificent Guy Verhofstadt, former Prime Minister of Belgium, arch-eurocrat, 
who said that Brexit may have led to war between Russia and Ukraine. I mean, it's been blamed for a lot of things, hasn't it? But I thought actually inciting Vladimir Putin for all of us who dared to vote leave. I thought that was brilliant. Even really. some arch remainers on social media were distancing themselves from that. <laughs> uh, Guy's a great man, but in this case, he's gone slightly too far. And slightly too far. But this third anniversary of us finally leaving the European Union, the end of the transition period, which of course coincided with the start of lockdown, as I said, it's coincided, hasn't it, with a sort of air of national despondency, those IMF forecasts, endless strikes, which we've barely mentioned almost because they've become, oh, all the, the teachers are on strike and the train drivers are on strike and the civil servants are on strike and the firefighters are going on strike. What's the big deal? It's almost not a news story anymore, even though it's astonishing, the biggest wave of strike action since that winter of discontent. But I think on the economic side, the real story that's happening at the moment is that I think inflation is being squeezed out of the system, Alison. I look at things like the producer price indices. My favourite. I don't explain them too much because <laughs> Velma will get a little talent <laughs> into them and then start telling me about these things. So anyway, take it from me that they are showing signs of quite rapid reduction now. The PPI, the price of stuff that firms buy that they need to create the goods and services that they then sell on to us, PPI is still above the retail price index and the consumer price index, which suggests there is still more inflation coming down the track. But the rate at which the PPI is falling is faster than the rate at which the consumer headline rates of inflation are falling, which is a positive. And at the same time as inflation being squeezed, I think it will fall quite quickly. I think interest rates will peak at four and a quarter percent in the coming months. But something else I want to mention is that I am seeing signals now coming out of the Treasury, completely unofficial signals that the Prime Minister and Chancellor are now actively considering a surprise at the March the 15th spring budget. And it's legislated for that corporation tax will go up from 19 to 25%. That is in statute. That was what Rishi Sunak announced when he was the Chancellor. There's an outside possibility that he may announce this coming March that that rise won't happen. And the interesting thing about that is it wouldn't be a tax cut. It would actually be keeping the tax where it currently is. But because the business community all thinks the corporation tax is going up by a lot, 6% points is a lot when businesses operate on margins of five or ten percent but if he freezes that corporation tax it will feel like a huge shot in the arm for corporate britain it will feel like a sort of clarion call that britain can see the green shoots we're pulling ourselves out of recession it will be seen as a huge stimulus even though it won't be a tax cut so no one can say it's irresponsible but I would then argue on top of that, there's something called the Laffer curve, which suggests that if you raise the rate of a tax, then you get less revenue because people change their behavior. And I think the Laffer curve applies particularly to corporation tax because businesses are so mobile, they can decide whether to invest or not at the flick of a switch, quite literally. And I think if you raise corporation tax, Alison, if Sunak and Hunt go ahead with that from 19 to 25, I think it will actually cost the Treasury money because I think that will push a lot of businesses over the edge, lock down ravaged firms, having a really difficult time. I think that rising corporation tax means that some of them will just throw in the towel and the Treasury will get less revenue overall, even though the headline rate of corporation tax has gone up. I'm not saying this freeze in corporation tax is going to happen. What I am saying is that it is not a completely outlandish idea and it is being considered at the top of government. You've said for a long time that that potential rise in corporation tax was nuts, haven't you? Given the sort of, you know, as you say, the terrible shocks that so many businesses have been dealing with. And I didn't know until I listened to my co-pilot's wise words that corporation tax, which sounds like it affects big manufacturers and so on, is actually right down to small shopkeepers and things like that. So I certainly hope that they don't raise it. Quite a shocking thing this week, Liam, particularly for Planet Normal denizens. We had an admission by the government that the Army's Information Warfare Unit monitored lockdown critics during the pandemic. We had the crosshairs on our back, co-pilot. It was Day of the Jackal. 
We're surprised we're still alive. We may have to check whether we're still alive. We've possibly been rubbed out and just uh... rummaging through our bins. <laughs> so there's something called the 77th Brigade, a specialist unit set up to counter disinformation and other online activity deemed harmful to the UK, assisted other government units in this task. And it was social media posts by people like my friend, the talk radio presenter, Julia Hartley Brewer, Reform Party leader, Richard Tice. They were scrutinized for accuracy and challenged if the government felt information presented to the public was incorrect, inaccurate or deliberately misleading. I mean, the government could hardly talk about presenting inaccurate or deliberately misleading information. As we well know now, co-pilot, a lot of things that we said at the time were inaccurate. Official information was indeed highly inaccurate and is being proven by the week to have been pitifully, woefully wrong. So this government reaction actually followed an article in the Mail on Sunday, which was based on reports by an anonymous army whistleblower and documents obtained by the civil liberties group Big Brother Watch. And it's worth quoting this army whistleblower who said, it is quite obvious that our activities resulted in the monitoring of the UK population, monitoring the social media posts of ordinary people. Now, I am going to do a so-called subject access request to check if I or we or indeed Planet Normal as a whole, were under that kind of surveillance. I don't know what you think, Liam, but people like Julia, Richard, Toby Young, these are good, patriotic British citizens who were trying to discuss things in the official narrative, which they found troubling. And the idea that the British army was wasting its time monitoring them is quite chilling to me. I mean, Can you believe that the army was used in that way during lockdown? I must say, I think it's extremely troubling. I don't think it's hyperbole to say that this is one of the most egregious overreaches of state power in British peacetime history. I use those words advisedly. What were you and I doing, Alison, to card-carrying national newspaper journalists who've been writing columns between us for 50-odd years in British papers, right, between us. I mean, most of those years are yours, but anyway. (laughs) (laughs) They are. I think veteran is the polite word. Highly experienced, distinguished. We were eyeballing official data. I'm a trained statistician. You are a very smart person who rapidly got your head around how to read statistics and explain them to a broad audience. And I know you consulted with numerous scientists, people you knew anyway, people that you got to know because you absolutely schooled yourself in what was going on. We both looked at the ONS dashboard every day. We discussed it every day and we put our findings on air and we wrote about them and the Telegraph Backed what we were doing while obviously scrutinizing closely the factual accuracy of what we were saying, as any decent national newspaper would. And of course, the Telegraph has a distinguished track record in terms of factual accuracy. And I must say, many, 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 many members of the public wrote to us during then and since with huge gratitude, almost moving yeah. for us, isn't it? To read. I mean, we still get it all the time. If you look at the reviews of our podcast, how many people said, you guys kept me saying during lockdown, you were vilified, but you've turned out to be right. And the idea that taxpayers were paying for people in the dark, you know, with white t-shirts on and khaki bottoms, paraphrase, (laughs) to try and suss us out and close us down is really, really concerning. It is worrying to me that this happened, Alison. More power to your elbow. Do find out if the two of us, Planet Normal in general, was being scrutinized in this way. This is something that I don't think you're going to let drop lightly. Hello, I'm Christopher Hope, but my pals call me Chopper, and you can too. Just dropping into my second favorite podcast to tell you about another Telegraph show, mine. As a Telegraph chief political correspondent, I spend my days holding politicians to account and asking them about the things that affect you. 
I speak to top politicians from across the political spectrum, commentators with their finger on the pulse, and of course, my talented colleagues at The Telegraph. So if that sounds like your cup of tea, please search Chopper's Politics, wherever you're listening to this. Cheerio! Since the war in Ukraine, of course, the UK's energy security has come under very close scrutiny. Without gas-fired power stations, plus lots of imported LNG gas, and even the cranking up of coal-fired power stations, there's no doubt it would have been impossible to keep the lights on. Until recently, any politician or journalist who dared to question the UK's commitment to net zero 2050, the legal obligation to slash our carbon emissions by mid-century, was dismissed as a crank. But the clear reality that windmills and solar have limitations and our energy security is fragile is causing many to rethink. Spectator journalist Ros Clark has a new book, Not Zero, How an Irrational Target Will Impoverish You, Help China and Won't Even Save the Planet. I started by reading Ross a paragraph from his own book, making it clear that he does believe that climate change is a problem. Ross Clark, great to have you with us here on Planet Normal. Towards the end of your book, you say carbon dioxide is accumulating in the atmosphere. Global temperatures are rising by around 0.1 degrees Celsius per decade. And it's highly likely there's a causal link between these two things. On these things, most people can surely agree. You don't sound like much of a climate sceptic. Well, I don't question that global temperatures are rising. Just because you accept global temperatures are rising doesn't necessarily mean you have to accept every bad policy that is dreamed up in order to try to reverse that. And and secondly, although, you know, I quite happily accept climate is changing, it's not quite as bad as the hysteria would put it. There's all kinds of hysterics out there. I mean, I went to a public lecture by John Kerry, the US climate envoy, a few weeks ago, and he claimed there that in front of an audience of climate scientists that 10 million people a year were being killed by the heat, and this was all down to the choices we make. I went away and researched it, found the paper to which he was presumably referring by the University of Monash in Australia, and what it actually said was that 5 million people a year were being killed by extreme temperatures, but nine-tenths of those were being killed by extreme low temperatures and only one-tenth by extreme high temperatures. That was true even in Africa. And what's more, the deaths from heat were increasing slightly. The deaths from the cold are decreasing at a faster rate. So actually, as things stand, climate change is leading to fewer deaths from extreme temperatures. But that's not a message that you would ever pick up from the sort of public discourse on this from John Kerry and many others. And you say, no, humans are not heading for Armageddon. We are not going to be driven to extinction as a result of climate change induced flood, fire and tempest. Observed changes in the climate today are moderate, bad in some ways, but beneficial in others. So how have we got ourselves in this situation, Ross, where somebody who writes a book challenging the whole net zero agenda will stand open to accusations questioning their sanity, despite, you know, in your case, a very distinguished journalistic track record. It's very weird the way the uh, debate has been sort of grabbed by this sort of extreme end of it, the sort of almost extinction rebellion message has been accepted by large numbers of people who, you you know, you read through the sort of intergovernmental um, panel on climate change, uh, there's this huge variation, this huge junction between what they say in their press releases and what the science actually says when you begin to read it. And in the uh, press releases, they're claiming things like, you know, the Earth, mankind's on the brink and so on, the planet's going to become unlivable. But then you actually look at the climate trends across the globe, actually contained within the body of the IPCC report, and you see a mixture of things. You see the temperatures are rising, extreme high temperatures are rising, extreme low temperatures are decreasing. There is some increase in rainfall, and some places are getting more troublesome rain. But there's also a decrease in the presence of storms in the northern hemisphere up to 60 degrees north, which is basically the Shetland Islands. And, you know, while some parts of the world 
world it might become harder to grow crops in other places it's becoming easier to grow crops and you know i'm listening on the bbc the other week they had a guy there claiming that yields from crops will fall by 30 percent over the next half century sounds terribly frightening but actually then you go and look at the real world data and crop yields are increasing they've increased sharply over the past 70 years they've increased over the past 10 years we're not heading for starvation as a result of climate change whatever you know the hysterics might try and tell us there's a potted history in your book ross of uh, the legislative process that led to the UK being one of the first countries to to legally sign up to a net zero target by 2050. Just sketch briefly how that target came about. Surely there were lots and lots of parliamentary votes and debate on such an important legislative development. You, You would think so. I mean, the original Climate Change Act was passed in 2008 and committed Britain to cut carbon emissions by 80% on 1990 levels by 2050. That was a post by about six MPs. Uh, We did actually have a vote on that one. But then in 2019, in the dying days of Theresa May's government, when the sort of country was focused on Brexit, the government slipped through this amendment to the bill, which um, commits us to reach net zero emissions by 2050. And there was no vote on that amendment, right? There was no vote. There was a a brief debate. One or two MPs sort of raised some concerns. The House of Lords did vote on it and they did pass an amendment saying that, well, actually, is the government going to tell us how it's going to get to net zero? But the government never did tell us how it was going to get to net zero. But the whole thing was nodded through Parliament anyway on the statute book. So we now have a legal commitment to uh, get to net zero emissions by 2050 even though the government has no idea how it's going to do it nor what it's going to cost. I mean, when the Treasury tried to price it up in 2021, it said, well, we just can't do it because we don't know how you can get to net zero. (laughs) It involves technologies which either haven't been invented or which haven't been scaled up, commercialised. You know, I think if you're going to put a legal commitment on yourself to do something, you ought to at least have some idea how you're going to get there. What's driving this? It can't just be journalists wanting to write headlines about Armageddon. There's money involved here too, isn't it? An awful lot of people are making an awful lot of money out of this so-called green industrial revolution. Well, exactly. Um, You know, we're sort of conditioned to think that all the vested interests are on the sort of climate change denial sides of oil companies saying, no, the climate's not changing and that sort of thing. But um, just at the moment, there seem to be vastly more vested interests on the other side, which are sort of preaching the Armageddon, advancing the idea we've got to get to net zero emissions. And you think there's a huge subsidies that are on offer, the money that's being uh, raised in the markets that we've got a sort of green investment boom, if you like. Some ideas that come out of the current situation will work. They will prove themselves and they will be adopted. But you can be damn sure that there are vast numbers of other technologies, things that are being developed at the moment, which will not succeed, which will fail. And, you know, we've already had this uh, last week, the failure of the British Vault Factory. This was the Giga Factory in Northumberland, which was supposed to produce all these car batteries and snatch a huge slice of the global market for Britain. Government was chucking money at it, there were other investors chucking money at it, and the whole thing went belly up in a couple of years. So, um, you know, we're going to have more of those British vaults, unfortunately, because um, just the sort of atmosphere we're in with the money being thrown after some ideas which will fail. What do you think, Ross, when you hear this often cited figure that solar and wind power is now, quote, nine times cheaper than fossil fuel power, electricity generated by fossil fuels. And why is it that if renewables are meant to be so much cheaper, then the price of electricity in this country that firms and households pay is set by the price of gas? 
Well, yes, to deal first with that nine times figure, that, that's a false comparison. That was made by a climate website, um, Carbon Brief, last summer. And they simply compared the long-term index link guaranteed prices that are offered under contracts to wind and solar farms with what are called the day-ahead prices for gas. Now, day-ahead price, as it sounds, the market has to pay to persuade a gas power station to turn on for a few hours, fire up for a few hours to produce some electricity when wind and solar energy is forecast to be very light. And of course, it's not a particularly efficient way of using gas. So it's as if the intermittency of wind and solar is causing the spike in spot gas prices, which is allowing people to make these spurious differences about energy costs between the various sources. And of course, the the renewable power is massively subsidised. Well, exactly. I mean, you're looking at sort of intermittent sources of energy like wind and solar. You can't just look at the cost of generating it in itself. You've also got to look at the cost of backup or storage or maybe constructing a worldwide grid so we can buy electricity from America when it's windy there and that sort of thing. And, you know, there are technologies which could potentially make up for the shortfalls in wind and solar, but they are all enormously expensive. And yet the government has committed to removing gas from the grid by 2035. By the way, we have things called capacity market, which is there to make up that sort of shortfall in solar and wind energy. And even though gas, you know, has been very expensive the last couple of years, it's still gas stations that keep winning those auctions, basically, because it's still cheaper than to store energy. If you're looking at sort of generating wind power, it's about sort of $50 per megawatt hour. You're looking to store that energy in lithium batteries. Well, it's about $300 per megawatt hour. So you're paying sort of six times over to store because it costs to generate in the first place. And, you know, we also have this sort of bizarre market construction, a bogus market was constructed on privatisation where everybody who's supplying power at one particular time is paid the same as the most expensive producer. So, you know, you might find yourself a megawatt short. You go to a gas power station. What does it cost to turn on your idle plant for a couple of hours to generate some power? And obviously it comes out very expensive because you've got to keep that plant idle for when it's needed. But then suddenly the whole market is rewarded with that price that we're having to pay. And households and firms are paying that I hesitate to use the word, Ross, that rigged price. It is. It is completely rigged market and it's completely silly. Green energy firms have been making a killing on this, or certainly the ones on the older contracts, which aren't sort of a fixed price, to the point which the UK government and the EU, by the way, has um, had to impose windfall taxes on the wind and solar producers because they were making so much money. The consumers are paying through the nose producers are making a killing and then the government is taxing the producers and handing the money back to the consumers in the form of this energy price guarantee you've got this sort of merry-go-round of money and we, we far better we could just government just reform the energy market and we had a sort of properly functioning market than the stupid rigged one that we have at the moment how has the war in ukraine ross in your view changed the debate about energy policy, energy security in the UK. I've certainly noticed suddenly they're mainstream. Suddenly everybody's talking about wholesale gas prices. Yeah, well, of course, the invasion of Ukraine and Western sanctions on Russia to have taken a huge bite out of um, European gas supply, which over the past year, we've managed to replace most of that with liquefied natural gas imported by ship from US. and Which doesn't count to our net zero target, of course, even though we use it. All the carbon <laughs> used in um, compressing the gas and liquefying it and then deliquefying it, shipping it across the Atlantic. 
<laughs> it's le- it's less efficient to do that. You lose about a tenth of the energy by transporting liquefied natural gas. We'd be far better. And of course, you know, a lot of that gas comes from shale wells, which we've been told are sort of dangerous to have in Britain. But if we had those shale wells in Britain, we would have been producing gas locally. It would have been cheaper. We wouldn't have had the spike that we had last year and not, not nearly as high as it was anyway. What do you think, Ross, about the way the costs of net zero are being distributed? It isn't usual, is it, as we are doing here in the UK, to put those costs of transition onto household fuel bills? No, I mean, on most things, you know, regressive tax, a tax which where the burden falls more heavily on the poor than the rich is, is seen as a very, very bad thing. But when it comes to the climate, the sort of rules seem to be the other way around. And you know, with wealthy households, we hand them great grants to buy an electric car. We um, pay them to put solar panels on their roof. You know, huge grants going to relatively well off. And that if you're poor, you're paying for those grants. You're subsidising those grants. Because you disproportionately, if you're poorer, pay a higher share of your household income on your energy bill. And of course, yes, yes, you do. Yes, these yes. levies are percentages of what you pay on your energy bill. Yeah, and that the London ultra low emission zones, another example of that. I mean, it's basically a tax on old vehicles. If you've got a diesel vehicle made before 2015 or a petrol vehicle made before 2005, then you're going to have to pay £12.50 a day to drive it anywhere in London. And yet it's completely ludicrous that we, uh, Sadiq Khan in that case, has come up with basically a tax on the poor. Briefly, Ross, do you think this ban on new petrol and diesel cars sales in 2030 is going to happen? Do you buy this whole electric vehicle revolution? I'm personally concerned that the batteries that we need for these electric vehicles, they use up an awful lot of rare earths and other commodities that are found in very difficult parts of the world, not least China. They do. I mean, there are a lot of problems with electric vehicles. The the purchase price is one of those problems. Um, And, you know, for years, the price of batteries seemed to be coming down. But then that was when the price of commodities was coming down. And the last couple of years, you know, commodities are turned the other way. And you're making batteries, a lot of rare earth metals. Suddenly the costs of producing batteries are going up. And until a couple of years ago, people were confidently saying the price of electric vehicles will be down to those of petrol vehicles by 2024. Well, nobody's saying that anymore. (laughs) People say, oh, it's cheaper to run an electric car, or at least it was till the electricity prices went up. But that completely ignored the fact that 60% of what you pay for a litre of petrol is tax. Whereas, you know, charge your vehicle at home, only 5% is is VAT. And, you know, government's not going to say bye-bye to £28 billion worth of road fuel uh, revenue. What it's going to do, it's going to tax vehicles in some other ways by, uh, you know, road pricing or something. So they're not going to be cheaper in the long run. Even if we do solve all those problems and say magically by 2030 you could buy an electric car for the price of a petrol one now and recharging network was sorted out and everything but it still wouldn't get you to net zero or anywhere near net zero because of the emissions in the constructions of cars making an electric vehicle involves half as many emissions again as making a petrol vehicle as the steel the plastics all the you know minerals in the batteries and then of course you've got to drive so have somewhere to drive and roads concrete and steel are again huge emitters of carbon emissions globally and you know if you if you're really going to get to net zero you've got to deal with each of those industries one by one and we just do not have the technology that can guarantee we can say with confidence that we can get to net zero by 2050 without sort of impoverishing ourselves. Ross Clark, author of Not Zero, How an Irrational Target Will Impoverish You, Help China and Won't Even Save the Planet. Thanks a lot for appearing on Planet Normal. Thank you. Well, I absolutely love that interview, Liam. And I really think this is a cause that Planet Normal needs to take up. We've seen COVID hysteria and we have the same pattern with net zero hysteria. 
as Ross explains so well, based on a lot of speculation. He doesn't deny that the planet is warming. He does question whether the fallout from that is going to be anywhere near as bad as the doomsters keep telling us. And meanwhile, the price for that, as with the COVID hysteria, is going to be picked up by ordinary men, women and children. And quite frankly, I am appalled. Why is our political class so useless? This is policy making by social media, isn't it? This is what happens. No one's got the guts to push back against the tsunami of woe that we, <laughs> keeps engulfing us all the time. They've put it in legislation that we've got to meet targets. Legislation that wasn't even voted on. Not even voted on. And the technology to make it happen, well, what are they going to get? The tooth fairy is going to come in and wave the magic wand. And I'm about to swear, Halligan, it's monstrous. No, I'm not going to replace my gas boiler on some sort of totally mental pretext. No, I'm not buying an electric vehicle because apparently they're hemorrhaging their value. And I live in a terraced house like millions of other people, and we aren't going to be able to charge our cars outside our house. So, so much of it is based on its absolute balls. It's quite a nice terraced house. Well, it is a nice terraced house, but it hasn't got a charging point outside it. So I'm asking you, why are they doing this? What is it? Is it they like occupying the moral high ground? Do they get to hobnob with other high status individuals in other countries? The normal people of this country should not be subject to this arrant bollocks. They should not. I think what's happening here, Alison, is that it's the combination of virtue, feel-good politics, and hard cash. There's an awful lot of money being made, as I discussed with Ross, out of this green industrial revolution. And look, I am completely with Ross, and it's clear to me that while we do need to wean ourselves off fossil fuels, we will need fossil fuels for a while, not least as a transition, and there's just no point in committing ourselves to targets that we have no idea how we can keep when the UK accounts for 1% of all global emissions (laughs) and the Chinese account for a third. That doesn't mean we should do nothing. It doesn't mean we should just crank up, you know, loads of coal fired power stations, but we're not. Coal used to account for 40% of the UK energy, you know, earlier this century, right? 10 or 15 years ago, it's now one or 2%. So we have made huge strides. Renewable energy is very, very important going forward. But we need to develop the battery storage. We need to find ways to harness it properly to get over the fact that it is intermittent by its very nature. And I'm not sure, actually, my last Telegraph column, we'll put the link in the show notes of this episode, I'm not sure about this electric vehicle, so-called EV revolution, because it relies on things like lithium, the price of which has gone up fourfold over recent yes. years. It relies on copper, five times more copper in an electric car than a conventional car. It relies on cobalt. It relies on all kinds of minerals and rare earths that the Chinese have lots of and we have very little of. The Chinese now account for 80% of all EV fuel cell battery production. We're trying to build so-called gigafactories here in the UK to create these very heavy batteries for electric vehicles. So then you build the cars nearby, so securing the future of our car making industry. And a lot of the private sector money just isn't there. That's what's been happening up in uh, Camis near the port of Blythe, just north of Newcastle, as we were discussing last week. British Vault, the company is meant to be building that gigafactory, which would be only our second in the UK, the first one being Chinese owned, naturally. They haven't been able to drum up the private sector money to unlock £100 million of government cash. And I think that betting the ranch on EVs is actually the wrong thing to do. And I've said that for a long time. We should be exploring hydrogen fuel cells. We should be exploring other methods of propulsion. Nuclear as well, the smaller modified nuclear reactors, which we should have been doing. You're right, Alison. Nuclear can play a much bigger role than it currently does in the generation of electricity for domestic use. Of course, it's not suitable for transportation, but there are other ways we can harness transportation that doesn't rely on these battery fuel cells that are really, really expensive, use up huge amounts of energy to make, and then they're very heavy 
and then you've got to transport them around. It just doesn't seem to me to be the right solution. And yet the government's backing it relentlessly to the point that it's going to ban sales of new petrol and diesel cars in 2030. I really can't see that happening. I increasingly feel that we should be pushing for a referendum on this. I don't think the public has been told the half of what this is going to cost us. And I think it's really sly and not at all acceptable. We're all of us at the moment living with the consequences of massive short-term view on energy policy, relying on foreign energy, and now it's come back to bite us on the bum big time. There's a song in that, bite us on the bum big time. (laughs) But bite on the bum big time. I think that could become our slogan, couldn't it? So I was reading in Net Zero Watch that German industry, and we know that the Germans absolute folly of Angela Merkel's policy of trusting that marvellous chap, Mr. Putin, relying totally on energy from Russia. She also closed down Germany's nuclear power stations because of the Fukushima disaster. When the Fukushima disaster, the failure had nothing to do with the nuclear power station. The failure was because of a massive tsunami. Yes, and they're all now scrabbling around for nuclear. But this net zero watch said that German industry is set to pay about 40% more for energy in 2023 than in 2021, and that a large energy price shock still lies ahead for European corporations. I mean, you've been talking about that. So I suppose the point I'm making is that having made this historic blunder of relying on becoming over-dependent on foreign energy, and certainly in the UK, not developing and becoming self-sufficient in our own energy, which we should have done, they now proceed to double down on that mistake, committing us to being reliant on energy or sources that don't yet exist or are highly unreliable or vastly expensive. So I think it's a con trick being played on the British people, and I am going to start writing that we need a referendum and that we should be looking at far down the pipeline, not 2050, 2100. Let's make a target that's realistic, not hugely punishing of normal people. Now onto our listener emails. Your message is sent to planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk. Please keep them coming. We absolutely love reading them and we learn so much. And as co-pilot Halligan will tell you, they're often shamelessly recycled in the Alison Pearson Wednesday column. This is Justin from David. David says, Dear Cosmonauts, thank you for your regular dose of sanity, which is much needed these days. My question is that if we are now producing large percentages of the electricity we require from renewables, how come the consumer doesn't benefit? Does it mean that the wind and solar companies are making a fortune? Shouldn't they be selling their energy at much lower prices than the gas we are buying? Or is it the case that the contracts with them were badly thought through? keep providing the sanity medicine, says David. Well, I think, Liam, we can highly recommend to David Ross Clark's excellent book. This is from Brian. Many years ago, a young lady taking blood from me, knowing I was a police officer, spent most of the 10 to 15 minutes telling me how the police should tackle crime. She'd recently completed a criminology module while studying for her open university degree, so she felt she knew all about the problems and how to fix them. The fact I had over 25 years' experience of policing didn't apparently count for much. I hadn't studied criminology by reading books. I've thought long and hard, writes Brian, about this in the years since and have concluded many of the problems facing this country could just be a result of too many people attending universities to read books and as a result becoming, quote, experts. Many of these experts are given decision-making authority, often in their first jobs, based largely on the fact that they are experts having the paper qualifications to prove it. But how much do they actually know? As experienced journalists, how would you both feel being told how to do your jobs by someone just out of university with a degree in journalism? And yet more and more, this is the situation being faced by experienced practitioners. So many of the decisions taken by these experts, says Brian, or those listening to them have proved wrong. The classic recent example, of course, being the shutting down of the economy and the locking down of the population during the COVID pandemic as advocated with certainty about this being the only sensible course 
by so many experts. Perhaps it's time to look beyond paper of qualifications and instead look at the whole person proffering them. Please keep up the good work. Your podcast is the one bright spot in these dismal times. Best regards, Brian. Oh, thanks for that, Brian. And so say all of us. This is from Dr. Kevin in the week that we're all filing our tax. Kevin says there are reports of the wealthy abandoning the UK due to tax changes. Tax changes which Sir James Dyson last week called stupid. In the 2020-2021 tax year, the top 10% of income tax payers paid 61% of all income tax and the top 1% paid 29%. Furthermore, it was also reported that 54% of all income taxpayers take more from the government than they give in taxes. Last year, says Kevin, some £390 billion was raised by the government in income tax and national insurance out of a total tax take of £715 billion. The departure of that top 10% of the wealthy would lose 61% of those income taxes over £237 billion, or 39% of the total tax collected. The remaining middle 36% of contributors and the 54% of net recipients become 40% and 60% of the reduced population, but with a £237 billion black hole now disappeared to foreign lands. To make good This loss of 61% of income taxes, says Kevin, the remaining 40% who actually make a positive contribution at the moment, these taxes will have to rise by just over 215%. Something something to look forward to there, Kevin. I said, I'm sure I'm going to find the money for the extortion and gas bill. We're meant to be upbeat. This takes the basic rate of income tax to 50% from 20%, the higher rate to 100% from 40%. We're going to be worse than Sweden without any of the good public services. And the additional rate to 112.5%. Don't believe it can't happen. Whoever heard of negative interest rates until recently? This is merely a wealth tax by another name. Or a tax rate above 100%. You've got to pay to work. Did Dennis Healy do that or am I making that up? There was a super tax of about 91% in the mid-70s. Yeah. Anyway, Kevin concludes, these new tax rates will increase the disincentives to work. We've hardly got anyone left working. Anyway, it's just me and you, Halligan. The consequences must be that more and more people decide that work doesn't pay and they too leave the workforce, if not the country. The UK will quickly resemble a Venezuela or a Zimbabwe, and people will indeed start leaving the country, perhaps in the plentiful rubber boats piled up along the south coast. At least that solves the problem of illegal immigration for the UK and increases it for France. A silver lining? Probably not. (laughs) Thank you, Kevin, for that calamitous forecast. And finally, Alison... Bob has struck again. Hooray, Bob! Bob the poet, former mug winner. He's got he's got a flotilla of Planet Normal mugs, and here is Bob with, <laughs> "What is a woman?" <laughs> it's such a simple question, but it baffles many folk, not least those politicians who are keen to woo the woke, and so they help the activists to spread this crazy cause to our classrooms and courtrooms, our language and our laws. It contradicts biology and erases women's rights. But the lunatics are taking charge. They have us in their sights. They force us to deny the facts we see before our eyes. Reality is abolished. The truth replaced with lies. I tell myself it's temporary. It's just a passing trend. But once our laws corrupted, where on earth's it going to end? Bob, you've surpassed yourself yet again. We can't offer you a Planet Normal mug because you'd have to move to a bigger house. (laughs) But we thank you, as ever, for your wonderful words. And on that bombshell, that's it from Planet Normal for another week because we leave our sanctuary of sweet reason, our flying refuge of reason, views, email of the week. It's Alison's turn. I think we're going to give it to Brian. Brian, good man, Brian. Do email us, planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk. Put mug winner in the subject heading of your email and give us your residential address if you enjoy planet normal please do leave us a rating and a review on apple podcasts or spotify and as we speed away from our beloved planet normal and the madness of planet earth comes back into view thanks as ever to our producers isabel bujard elliot lampitt and our editor zoe hitch 
Stay safe and in touch with us and with each other. Until next week, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from him. <laughs>